What's up, fam? Ah, today, man, we're going to be talking about the connection between culture and food. I'm telling y'all, you need to stick it out. This is going to be a long video, but you need to stick it out because this is going to be life-changing. So let's bring them out, bring them out. Bring them out, bring them out. Toast first, discussion later. See you on the other side. Peace. So fam, you need to get hydrated. Let me make sure I got all my stuff in place. Got all my stuff in place. Now, for those that's taking the Guza Saba Challenge, once again, I'm going to stress. The only supplements you need is water and air, right? Now, I'm going to stress this. For all those that are taking the Guza Saba Challenge, um, I post it up on the Facebook um, link later up down below. It's always posted at the bottom of my videos. For those taking the Goose Sapa Challenge. Now, I'm offering tools. That's it. You don't have to do the fast, the intermittent fast. You don't have to do the meditation. You know, I'm giving you tools for your belt. Um, I'm sharing information that I feel um, that can help you make a healthy and powerful change in your life. All I'm doing is making it available. That's it. Now, what you choose to use off your tool belt is your choice. Because like all good um, workmen or work, work women, or however you want to look at it, we all have tool belts. And we all pull certain tools off at certain times. But when we go into different situations, it's nice to have the tools on the belt that we need. Do you understand? Right? So intermittent fasting, you might not, you might not like that. You might not want to try that, right? I'm just telling you the benefits that it have shown in my life, all right? So, on it, you know, now, those that's going to take the 21-week challenge is going to be a little bit different. You're going to have to make an investment in that, and, and, and you're going to be expected to go through the whole process. The 21-day challenge is free. It's, it's on you. What you take, what you don't take, that's on you. But I'm saying, if you follow the challenge, if you follow the process, because remember our ancestors say, the best life is achieved by a systematic process. They didn't say what that process was. They said a systematic process. I'm providing you new systems that you can start adding to your life and over a 21 day, over the 21 day challenge, see changes. Promise. You know what I'm saying? Now, so, we done brought the ancestors out. Let's get hydrated, family. I had to run out and get some water. I had to run out and get some water. Get your water. Always remember, we start our day with that water. This is um, Ice Mountain. They say pure quality. Um, this is the 
33.8 ounces. So one of these will satisfy my morning jump start. Now remember I told you I had to start drinking a little bit more uh, water when I wake up, right? Grab your glass, drink with me family. We grown folks, we drinking out of glasses, right? This is a ritual, we drinking out of glasses. One down. We know about two of these is about 16 ounces. Chlorophyll. A review is coming, fam. Review is coming. The chlor oxygen, so that y'all can see the label. I post it up so that you can get it. You can support the journey by if you want to try it, you go and get it off of Amazon, or you can go and support um, the local um, health food stores, right? turns the water dark green but of course y'all won't see it because my glass is blue Finish up this 33 ounces. Let me get to the toast. All right, today. That's that thin scene with that roof floating in there. Oh, uh, and since and I know some, of, I, I know some of my regular viewers is like, "What in the hell are you doing up uh, this early on Saturday, brother?" Y'all like remember, right? I, um, I did that. I did the five day fast, and then I got right back on my intermittent fast. So I don't need as much sleep. Oh, you're not late. You're not late, Miss Tiffany. All right, you're not late at all. Thank you for uh, for coming. We're about to do the toast right now. What I'm also gonna do is live on camera. I'm gonna eat some ginseng root since I'm off my since, since I'm gonna take this day off for this intermittent fast. So those of you that's been following, y'all know that I pulled some ginseng root up out of my. Um, out of my 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 um, ambrosia, so we got some ambrosia soaked ginseng that we gonna eat as well. You know what I'm saying? Now ginseng is real good for you. We'll have I do a show on the ginseng, but it's rare that I run across the root. I finally found a place where I could get the root, and we are gonna sit up here, and brother Hot Tim is gonna eat one of the, one of those roots for you right now, right? But right after we gotta salute our ancestors now. Once again, let me announce, the show today, right? You know my blog is always a day behind. The show today will be about the African diet and the importance of diet to culture, the connection, the power. Listen, family, this is going to be a show that's going to change your life, right? Because a lot of us slipping on the power of culture, and then we slipping on the tools of culture, right? One of the tools is food, right? And how food identifies the culture that you follow. What type of culture are you following? But I'm, I'm going to stop right there. First call on the creator by whatever name you choose to call that creator. Those that are joining me on Facebook right now, if you have ancestors you want to post up,
post them up, fam. I'll, I, I, I'll shout them out, right? Because we got to salute our personal ancestors. Personal ancestors. Not the famous. Your family. All right? We call on the creative by whatever name you choose to call it creative. We call that great energy into our rooms, into our lives, so that we can feel it and so that we can share that energy. Even though we know it's all, all around us, we're activating it now. Right, we're becoming conscious of it, and we toast it and we say I say. From there, we move to our personal ancestors. We call on our grandmothers and our grandfathers, our great grandmothers, our great grandfathers, our mothers and fathers if they made their transition, our, um, our aunts and our uncles if they made their transition. We call on our friends and our cousins and our friends. We call on our nieces and nephews, all those that have made their transitions. We got one coming in right now. We got a Susie B. Smith and Teresa Clay. Um, she got to see more down here. Let me move it. All right, there we go. Go ahead. Go ahead, Miss Tiffany Smith. We got C Susie B. Smith. We got Teresa Clay. We got Jenny Clay. We got Melvin Hodge. Any others? Keep them coming, fam. Come, keep them coming. We got to salute our ancestors. We got to remember those individuals. Who remembered us those individuals that helped build us into who we are we got our herman copeland any others coming fam keep them coming keep them coming remember your people we got to remember them because hell for african is being forgotten forgotten mildred copeland any others any others those people who fed us when we couldn't feed ourselves. Those people that walked for us when we couldn't walk. Those people who gave us courage to face situations that were scary. Those people that told us stories about our families. Those people that told us stories to entertain us. Those people that had us laughing at family events. Those people that made us sad at events. Those people who disciplined us when we needed it. Those people who set examples for us. Those people who set the models for how we live. Those people we want to remember because those people helped us become who we are, right? And we need to always salute them. Those people who made sure that you was able to exist because I need you to understand how important you are, right? In Giamma, we talk about the family pyramid. We don't talk about the family tree, right? It's at the family tree, we at the bottom. At the family pyramid, we at the top. We are the highest evolution of our family. What do you represent? What was your family evolving over all this time for? You are the you you are the apex, and your children are now standing on your shoulders. She also put up Samuel Clay. Shouts out, right? Listen. So now. And I want you to think about this. If you go back 20 generations, it took over a million people being in the exact right place at the exact right time in order for you to be here. So you was destined to be here. So if you are ever in doubt, just think about your ancestors who had to be at the exact right place at the exact right time to meet that other person to make you. Because it took two parents to make you, it took four to make them, it took eight to make those, it took 16 to make that in the crew, it took 32 to make that, 64, and you do that 20 times, it's gonna take you down there to a million. So it took a million people being in the exact right place at the exact right time in order to make you. So family, listen to me. You have to salute your ancestors, right? You have to. And the best salute is not just us lifting our glass. The best salute is in how we live and how we treat others. Because we show where we come from. We show what cloth we was cut from. All right? Shouts out to Miss A. I see you out there. All right, now, so... What we're going to do also is I'm going to go through my family line since I did other people's family line. Y'all keep them coming. Miles Brown, Miss Ann, Robert and Texana Davis, Herman Brown Sr., Rosalie Tilly, Georgia Willie Walter, Crystal Fanny Gasson, Alina, Uncle Chris, um, Geneva Brown, Cleveland Brown, um, my Aunt Alvira, Aunt Gina. Margaret Ellis, Cecil Ellis, Wash Ellis, Montague Pittman L, John Fillard, Jamon Jones, Mama Malika, 
to pet my rock. No more acts. Elder Donaldson. Elder Harrison. Jeremiah Tappan. Pastor Yusuf Weston. Um, that's all I can think of right now. So we're going to sue all those that came to our hearts. And and we even toast those that escaped our minds. Because brother, brother, brother Hot Tim is kind of old. So we toast and we say, I say. From there, we move on to this present moment. Today is Kaumba. Um, we got Amina Robinson. We toast Miss Amina. We move from there to the present moment, which is Kumba. But we, we'll, we'll stay there as long as people got sending them out. I'm going to toast them. But we move. Today is Kaumba because those that, that take to the Good Saba Challenge, the first thing is to, trans, to translate the week into our principles, right? So that each day we're able to look at our principles and practice it. Rather than talking about what's called the day of the week, we salute that principle. So today is Kaumba, that day of creativity. All right? We're looking for that creativity today, y'all. Look for it. Um, I understand there's an African American Heritage Festival going on down at Long Street. Let's go down there and see some creativity. I'm, I'm going to grab my kids and I don't know about grabbing my kids. I got to think about that. Yeah, I would love them to go, but, you know, them girls. We're going to toast the moment. I got to think about that in this moment. Now we're going to toast our, our, our future generations. We're going to toast our children, our children's children, on to infinity. I think I'm going to take my kids down there after this toast. So um, we're going to go down there, you know what I'm saying, and we're going we're gonna to celebrate. But we got to celebrate our children now. So that they can celebrate us in the future. So we toast them and we say ashe. From there, I toast each and every last one of you. I thank you for joining me um, in this moment as we toast. And I salute every last one of you. I salute your struggles. I salute your victories. I salute your joys. I salute your troubles. And I know a lot of y'all like, brother, I tell you, why you salute my troubles? Because really, it's the troubles that make us into who we are. It's the hard times that really make us into who we are. It's, it's, you know what I'm saying? So I'm saluting those that brought you into my life, right? So I toast you, right? And I, anything that you want to happen, now is the time to ask. So we toast and we say, I say, I say, I say. I wish each of you peace, power, joy, and 100 years. Man. This is that mature. Ooh, ginseng. Listen. Now. They call ginseng the man root. I want y'all to look at that. I keep on showing y'all that. I look like a little man in there. So... Let me pull out the ginseng root. Live on Facebook. We are going to eat a ginseng root. Let's see. And let's see what the effects are. Look out, world. Look out. Kind of bitter. Wouldn't expect that. This set in this one right here specifically set. And some ambrosia for, well, actually, it's set in there maybe nine days. Very bitter. Not something I would go to the restaurant and order. Don't know if it's going to kill me or not. But y'all get to see it live if it do. Oh, like and share, y'all. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Ain't like I put it on a sandwich or nothing. 
Mmm. Okay. This hit me now. Yeah. Damn. All right. So we got eight the ginseng root. Now, those that have been following me, y'all know that I have been kind of conscious of this whole parasitic thing, right? All the parasites. Yes, it enhances the libido. Yes, it does. My wife better watch out. Because <laughs> I think I'm feeling it. Eating ginseng and drinking in ginseng ambrosia. Life is good. So here we go. So, I'm looking for a detox room and come up with a combination. Now, the one I've been doing lately is this is not apple cider vinegar. I can hear it. This is that ambrosia vinegar. Vinegar I made from my own vinegar. Keep on telling y'all, brother, how Tim ain't playing. Oh, my fault. Shouts out to Real Fake Media. I'm going to catch y'all show this morning while I'm cooking for my kids because I'm eating this morning. So, just letting y'all know. I couldn't catch it last night because I got into a conversation with one of my brothers. Now, let me tell y'all something. When y'all building your teams, right? When you're building your tribe, you always got to have a scholar. A woman and a scholar. Why I say woman? Women are the best organizers. I, I'm sorry. Y'all can on me if you want. Women are the best organizers. And you got to have a scholar. Now, why do I say scholar? Because you always got to have somebody who digests books. Not just read them. Digest books and can introduce you to new information. But the whole purpose is to stay up on the latest information. So, we got that ginseng vinegar. I mean, that, that ambrosia vinegar. This is not ginseng ambrosia. This is, gins this is just straight ambrosia vinegar. I let it age to where it becomes vinegar-like. Where vinegar you smell. Now, um, I want to send shots out to Miss... Miss Sabrius, plus size fashion designer. She's on YouTube. If you get an opportunity, please um, subscribe to her channel. She's a plus size clothes designer. She also do some things with um, diets and, and or, or different diets. But she brought up the point that everybody can't take turmeric. Now, Everything that I give you, I actually do research on. Everything that I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm not saying that you need to try, right? But in my in my readings, I found that turmeric is real good for helping your body get rid of um, parasites, right? It help clean you out, period. Just not just the parasite, but help clean you out, period. So I'm using turmeric, but Mr. Bree has brought up the point. That in her personal research, she found that turmeric might not be good for people who have an iron deficiency. And see, this is why this internet thing is so important. Because we're able to share information instantaneously. She looked at what I was doing and said, hey, hey, we want some of the people that if you're not, if you're iron deficient, you know what I'm saying? It might not be good for you. So everything that you see me do, right? Make sure you research it. And then if you find something, let me know. And I'll let people know as well. So I'm putting a little bit of turmeric in that. Help kill some of those bacteria. You already know I'm crazy about the coconut oil. Especially since I could buy it directly from Africa. And I had a dream I was in Ghana last night. So this means I'm going to go. I'm going to seal the deal. Where I'm gonna, I'm gonna import coconut oil 
as well as palm seed oil and some other oils here as well. So y'all know I'm heavy on these oils. So throw a little bit of that in there. Why are you throwing oil in the brother out there? Once again, antibacterial, antimicrobial, right? I'm telling y'all, man, when I read about them parasites, and if you missed the show, you need to get on the YouTube piece. Follow me on YouTube, right? Because I, I broke down a lot of those uh, parasites. Oh, yeah. Now, you get this coconut oil at an African store for... Six dollars and fifty cents. This big bottle, and I take teaspoons of it. Now I'm putting it into my drink. Then also oil adding, right? Now I'm gonna do another. I'm gonna do a follow up on oil adding because I I let all y'all know that I started oil adding. Now I I took a couple days off. My mouth start hurting again, right? But anyway, I'm gonna show you. How powerful oil letting is. Because when you oil let, it pulls the poisons up out of you through your mouth. And I'm going to show you the proof that this stuff is pulling something up out of me. Right? So I might, I'm going to do that soon. Because it, it's crazy when I show y'all. Alright. So now, you put the oil in there. The world famous cayenne pepper. Why cayenne, Brother Hatem? Because cayenne helps with the blood. It's a good tonic. Get the whole system moving. But then on top of that, whatever you add cayenne to, whatever herbal combination you add cayenne to, it helps speed up the process. Those of you that took some, ever had a, a full teaspoon of cayenne know what the hell I'm talking about. Oh, all African stores. I'm going to say almost all African stores got coconut oil. Almost all of them. Hell, go to some um, Chinese stores. They have them too, right? You know, I go to Africa stores because I'm trying to support the culture. Um, so, last but not least, we got that. Cinnamon. Yep, cinnamon helps kill parasites. Oops, now I got to clean up. But I'm going to have to clean up anyway because I'm about to cook. So we got some of that cinnamon in there. Now, I don't have my death eater. And y'all like, brother, I'll tell you what's your death eater. Death eater is a death eater ambrosia. And a death eater ambrosia is composed of sometime. Because I, I got two recipes. I got the pure death eater, which is just dandelion root and burdock root. And then I got the Death Eater Ambrosia Tea, which is the Death Eater Ambrosia, which is the uh, dandelion root, burdock root, and some of the Ambrosia Tea, right? Both of them go through the similar a similar process, but one is just straight dandelion root, straight burdock root. Why dandelion burdock root? Both of those help clean out the liver. The liver releases bile, which helps clean out the body and help get rid of some of these uh, um, parasites. And I know y'all like, but I tell you, you said parasites about seven times. Listen, when you when you do your research or look at my video, one or the other, you find out all the damn parasites that is poss possibly attacking your body, and all of the things that some of these parasites. They lead to diabetes, they lead to kidney function, dysfunction, they lead to messing up your eyes, they lead to messing up your nasal cavity, it leads to infecting your brain, all this shit. And a lot of this stuff comes from some of the food that we eat, and yeah, it, it's crazy. So, then I put this in. Mix it up. Where else on where else on Facebook can you get the motherfucker mother telling you how to live a hundred years? Look at this. Live a hundred years. Healthy. See, cause this is the point. This is the point. We want to live. It ain't even just live 100 years, but the point I'm saying is, we want to live a long, 
healthy life. Right? I want to be driving to the end. I want to be able to do everything that I'm doing right now to the end. And even more. <clears throat> And I want to be able to share my wisdom and move around with people, right? Because one of the things that I'm seeing is we got an influx, we got a, a, a dementia and um, uh, I don't, I see my grandfather go out with dementia and, and Alzheimer's and I don't want that and I don't want to put that burden on my children and I don't want to put that burden on me. You know what I'm saying? Um, my grandfather died without knowing who I am. When he made me who I am. You understand? I mean, do you know how do you know how painful that was for my mother? Right? To for her to one day go into a room and and her father not recognize her. And 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 we know that one of the sources of this is how we eat. And what we consuming. So, I mixed that drink up. Y'all thought I was going to drink that. Psych. I'm gone. Just mess with y'all. I had to get, you to clean up this mess. I'm going to drink this. And then I'm going to say peace, peace, Facebook. And then I'm going to get into my segment over with, with my YouTube fam. Years with your peace, power, joy. Not the best tasting stuff, but it's not the worst tasting either. Because this is my belief, family. I believe if you could take a shot of liquor, right? You don't do that shit for the taste. You don't drink beer for the taste, right? Then a lot of this shit is nothing to me. Shit, I, I take a shot with the best of them. You see what I'm saying? If I could take a shot of liquor, I could take a shot of health, like it ain't nothing. This ain't nothing. You know what I'm saying? I done had, listen, I done said, listen, I done sat and, 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 and drank with elders that almost killed me. Right? I'm like, what the hell is this? Right? This right here, clean you up. Hell, if you got a hangover, the mixture I just got right here will help you out. Alright? So I'm gonna finish it. I put more water in it. Cause I wanna get all of the herbs on into me. Hell, I'm not even hungry. But I'm gonna get up and make some some food for my kids and my wife. Peace out, Facebook. Now it's us. Alright, YouTube. So, y'all see I finished my stuff. So, today, what are we talking about? I told y'all earlier. The African Heritage Diet. I know some of y'all like, Brother Hot Tim, you already talked about the African Heritage Diet. But I don't think I talked about it on the channel, right? So, and then also I'm going to talk about the relation of food to culture, right? So, now, for those that don't know, you go to oldways.com. Old ways, like O L D W A Y S. Now, 
what brought me on to these this group here is this. I wanna I just wanna stress this. Um, there was a study conducted by uh, a very small study. I need to. I, I wanna I wanna stress that because you know I got some of my my scholars out there. Very small studies, and with the University of Pittsburgh, they took twenty African Americans and twenty South Africans, and they switched diets for two weeks. In this time, the Africans consumed traditional American food that um, we in the West, or the Africans in the West, consume meat and cheese high in fat content, while African Americans took on a traditional African diet, high in fiber, low in fat, with plenty of vegetables, beans, cornmeals, with little meat. After the exchange, researchers performed colonoscopies on both groups and found that those in the African diet group increased the production of beauty rate that's B-U-T-Y-R-A-T-E, a fatty acid proven to protect against colon cancers. Members of the American diet group, on the other hand, developed changes in their gut that scientists say preceded the development of cancerous cells. We wanted to show how diet changes cancer, so we used biomarkers and looked at the proliferation rate that has been tied to cancer. Now, you can find this article. Um, this is by Sam P. K. Collins. Um, the site ain't on here. But it's like, what happened when scientists put African Americans on an African diet and Africans on an American diet? Okay? So now, the American Society for Clinical Oncology recently announced that obesity... Now, okay, before I even get to that. So, now... I just happened to be doing some research and I found this thing called the African American the African Heritage Diet, which which people found that when you connect people to their cultural diet, they stayed healthy. Okay? When you connect people to their cultural diet, when you when because because whether you know it or not, food is an expression of the culture. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, out of the food, out of a staple, uh, what they call it a staple, out of a staple product, most civilizations rise. You know, you have whole cultures that rose on the back of food. You know what I'm saying? Usually a starchy food. Like in Africa, one of the, uh, 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 a staple was... Um, yams. In other countries, it was rice. In other countries, it was corn. When you find these staple crops, you find civilizations rising up out of them. And then other foods start coming because you got to have a staple, something that holds things in place. And this food is a major component of the culture. Why? Because this food allowed the culture to develop in the first place. Cultures develop around food. And we have to understand this, right? Cultures are, are, you know, so so so. what you eat says a lot about you, right? So, all right, so I want to bring this point up. The American Society for Clinical Oncology recently announced that obesity will soon surpass tobacco as the leading cause of cancer. Now, I don't know if you knew, knew to that like me. But did you know obesity can cause cancer? Right? I know, like, but I this is not a diet show. No, nah, it's not about diet, but it's about us moving to the greatest, the greatest, as they say on London Real, the greatest version of ourselves. Right? This is what it's about. It's about moving to the greatest you you can be. I have a responsibility to you. Right? How can I talk about bringing those five elements into line if I don't cover it? See, now, in, in the 21-day in the challenge, we touch on all these. We touch on, we touch on the intuition. We touch on the mental. We touch on the emotional. We touch on the spiritual. We touch on the physical. Right? You know what I'm saying? Because in order for us to bring ourselves to a point where we can form that fist so that we can punch, so we can punch so we could punch life in his face. Right? 
Man, talking and am I about to be attacked? The hell. Punch life in his face and get what we need. You know what I'm saying? Because really, I mean, really, because that's what it's about. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you can't ask life nicely for what you want. You got to snatch it. And I'm trying to get y'all ready, right? I'm trying to, that's, that's my responsibility as a self-mastery coach. That's my responsibility as, as, a, as a culture builder. I used to say nature, but as a culture, that's my responsibility. I got to get you ready, right? So if, if, that, if that thumb of the hand that we're grabbing with is not working, it's kind of hard to grab without a thumb. And that thumb of, of, of our five-part system is... The physical health. So we have to identify as far as culture building. I have to identify as far as culture building how important, how important the food is. So now, with this African heritage diet, let's get to it. All right. So it says African Americans are at high risk for many chronic diseases compared to other Americans, according to the U.S. Center of Disease Control and Prevention, because we are the farthest away from our traditional foods. African Americans are 29% more likely to die of all causes, um, more likely to die of all causes than Americans as a whole, and they make up 4.5 times as many emergency room visits for asthma attacks. Various studies also shown that African Americans are 1.4 to 2.2 more likely to have diabetes than whites and have higher rates of obesity. Diet is in, in many cases a prominent factor in chronic diseases like the Southern Diet, characterized by researchers at University of Alabama and Birmingham as a heavy, is heavy in fried fruits, processed meats, and heavily sweetened beverages. It's often seen as a traditional diet of many African Americans, but in fact, a healthier, more um, solidly traditional model can be found by looking for foods brought to the New World by Africans, along with those they adopted here. In truth, African Americans on average eat more leafy green vegetables than other Americans, and more legumes like black eyed peas. By starting with these healthy habits and looking to always African heritage and health pyramid for additional inspiration, African Americans could take pride in a way of eating that uniquely reflects the wisdom of their ancestors. I didn't write that shit. Y'all know I'm always talking about the ancestors, right? Listen, listen. The diets that we are currently consuming are not Design. We are eating. We are still even. We even those of us that's getting away from pork and shit. We're still eating a slave diet. We're eating a diet of homeless people. What do What do I mean by that? We're eating a diet of of individuals who are homeless. I'm eating what I can when I can, even though I have the wherewithal to not do that. Right. What. Let, I'm gonna get into it. Let me just get into it. So, so I'm most, I'm asking everybody that's taking a goose side for challenge. Leave if you're not. Even if you're not African American, at least go to old ways and see how can you align your diet with your ancestral heritage, because those foods allow for your people to exist in the first place. There is there is a symbiotic relationship between the food that people eat. And who they are. And even them being able to claim who they are. There is a connection between food and culture that we need to explore. So, the ancestors of African Americans brought many wonderful food traditions to parts of the Caribbean, South America, and southern states of the United States. Maybe these were your great-great-grandparents. You know what I'm saying? So they get down into all of that. So um, what I want to do is common foods, leafy greens. Um, I won't go through all that. You can look it up on the site. What I want to get into is the connection between culture and food. They even got a shopping list for you, family. They even got a shopping list for you, right? Because I'm already running over, right? Um, 
I'm trying to get it to where I can give y'all something real quick, right? But it's so hard because right? it's like it's so much needed, and I, you know, and I don't want to rob you. All right. So, food culture and the tradition of the world. So I want y'all. I want y'all really l l listen to where I'm going. In all cultural traditions, food is only one aspect, but yet it is probably one of the most persistent. Yeah, because you can't have culture if you don't got food. There is no cultural group and no individual for whom at least one specific food, the memory, taste, or smell of which does not evoke a pang of loving nostalgia. Food plays an inextricable role in our daily lives. Without food, we cannot survive. But food is much more than a tool of survival. Food is a source of pleasure, comfort, and security. Food is also a symbol of hospitality, social status and status and religious significance. Why we select to eat, how we prepare it, serve it, and even how we eat it are all factors profoundly touched by our individual cultural heritage. This is from an article I found on the internet called Food Culture and Tradition. So we're gonna leave that one there. You gonna look that up. Alright, so I found another one. Journal of International Business and Cultural Studies. Um Volume 8, June 2014, Food and Identity, Food Studies, Cultural and Personal Dietary, um, Personal Identity. Food Studies Culture. Cultural and Personal Identity. This is by Jenny M. Almerico of the University of um, Tampa. Now, she breaks down what food studies. Food studies is not a study of food itself. Now, there is something called food study, people. I want you to understand, right? Because if you're going to run the world, you got to look at it all, all aspects, right? So, that's what a university does. A university collects knowledge, Right? That's all it is. They connect knowledge and they dispense knowledge, right? Because when you bring all these people with all these ideas, new ideas emerge, right? It's called comparative studies. So, right, you might come up with something in mathematics and somebody might come up with, with something in anthropology and you might be able to connect that mathematics with whatever that person came up with anthropology and get a different understanding and a deeper understanding. And even if you don't, it might be somebody else who is well studied, right? This is why we got to look at mastery. Hell with this being jack of all trades, family. We got to start pushing ourselves and our children towards mastery. Because mastery is an important part of our culture as African people. All right. Food studies is not a study of food itself. It is an emerging interdiscipl interdiscipl interdisciplinary field of study that observes the intricate relationship among food, culture, and society from a number of disciplines in the humanities, social science, and sciences. You want to conquer people? Conquer their food. Because that's what I'm getting to. Right? You want to conquer people? Conquer their food. You want to unhinge? I mean, because we talk about taking the culture, you know, destroying a religion. Boom, boom, boom. Take that staple food. And because that's why it's called a staple, because it hold the culture in place, destroy the staple and the culture falls apart. By examining, by examining the what, where and how and why of our food choices and the food habits, we develop a better understanding of ourselves. By examining the what, where, how and why of our food choices. Right, family? What is the what, where, why, and how of your food choices? Right? You get a better understanding of yourselves. Right? What are we choosing to eat? All right. Culture. This is in her um, introduction. Culture. This thing with a strong relationship to anthropology focus on the fact that humans create culture as a way of making sense of their social and physical worlds. I'm skipping through this. Why food studies? Food choice exposes a group or a person's beliefs, passions, background, knowledge, assumptions, and personality. Hawk Lawson, 2004, introduced the concept of food voice. 
She suggested that what one eats or chooses not to eat communicates aspects of a person's identity or emotion in a manner that that words alone cannot. So we we're speaking when we're choosing some of this some of this stuff that we're eating, like fast food. You know what I'm saying? Not taking time to sit on meat because we don't view food as that important, right? But to, you know what I'm saying? To a to 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 somebody caught up in a slave mentality, food is not that important. It's just a a, a energy source, right? Right? When 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 I can guide the relationship with your food, right? I can control you. You see food as an energy source. All right, now let's keep on going because I'm gonna, I'm gonna build that. Humans, however, do not feed. All right, cool. Food provides animals the nutrients needed to maintain life and grow, and growth when ingesting. When most animals feed, they consume foods needed for their well-being and do so in a similar way at each feeding humans however do not feed they eat this trait distinguishes humans from other animals humans gather hunt cultivate plants and raise livestock for food consumption humans also cook use utensils to eat and institute a complex set of rules following a code of etiquette to govern how they eat appropriately the human trait of shame food is exclusive to its species. Humans relate to food in a way, in in a way that is unique to mankind. We do not simply feed. Family, are you eating or are you feeding? Family, are you eating or are you feeding? Right? Because if you're feeding, you are. One of the lower animals. You are a beast of burden. Food and identity. There's this area called food habits. Also known as food culture or food ways. Um, it says Kittler, Sacher, and Nams in 2012 coined the term food habits. Also known as culture of food ways. Describe the manner in which humans use food, including everything from how it is chosen, acquired, and distributed to who prepares, serves, and eats it. They stated that the significance of the food habits process is that, is that it is unique to human beings. They ponder why people spend so much time, energy, money, and creativity in food. Now, we all know the saying, you are what you eat. Right? We know this. You are what you eat. How are we eating? Right? Research shows that the listen, listen, research shows that the relationship between the foods people eat and how others perceive them and how they perceive themselves is remarkable remarkable. So we won't we'll skip past that. Now, let's look at the social and psychological factors have in have an influence on people's food habits and choices. What are the social and psychological factors that are influencing how you eat? And are they influencing you towards healthy eating? They learned that children tend to choose not listen, listen, for the future generations. They learned that children tend to choose foods eaten by admired adults like teachers, but not their parents. Children also choose food similar to that eaten by favorite fictional characters, peers, especially their older brothers and sisters. Now, when we look at a lot of the characters in um, our children's um, existence that they look up to, what are they eating? You know what I'm saying? I mean, what are some of the peer groups that you allow your children to hang with? What are they eating? Because now it's like this. You are what you eat. So you eating sugar. You eating processed foods. Right? But if you only look at it as feeding like an animal, it don't matter, right? Because it's just it's just an energy source. It's just so that I can survive. But if you are trying to live a human existence, if you are trying to live a higher being existence, right? You eat. 
You don't just feed, right? And you are what you eat. So if you are consuming processed, if you are consuming sugar, if you are consuming fast food, right? Then you are what you eat. A sweet, fast, processed person. Right? So now, family, listen, when we talk about taking the challenge, you want to go to the next level. Right? In anything that we do. Right? The first thing we got to get a hold of is that physical. We got to get a hold of it. We got to get control of it. This is our shell. This is our tool of expression. And if we don't strive to get control of this, if we not even strive, it's easy to get. We, we just got to put the work in. All right, let's go. Cultural identity. This is from her. Culture, culturally speaking, in essence, what one eats defines who one is and is not. Cultures define as the beliefs, values, and attributes practiced and accepted by members of a group or community. Culture is not inherited. It is long learned. The food choices of different cultural groups are often connected to the ethnic behaviors and religious beliefs. Eating is a daily affirmation of one's cultural identity. Is it any wonder, right? Grippos. For those that are not in, in Central High, Grippos is, 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 is not part of, I mean, but it's, it is, it, what you eat daily confirms your cultural identity. I see this in my house. My wife, like I keep telling her, she's from Ghana, right? She, I mean, I'm seeing fish heads in the goddamn refrigerator. You know what I'm saying? I, I know some of y'all laughing. Whole fish, right? I mean, all types of oils that she done influenced me and, 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 and her kid and our children with. You know what I'm saying? I'm seeing this shit all the time. Eating is a daily reaffirmation of one's cultural identity. What culture are you identifying with? Right? If you are eating daily, I mean, think about this. If you are eating fast food daily, you are identifying with the culture of uh, capitalism. Food of feeding and not eating. You are identifying with a uncivilized culture. Right? We have we have we have uh advanced all we done uh, life is a cycle that goes round and round into the laws of my yacht I'm bound. We have went in a full cycle to where we done moved from feeding through eating and developing cultures and now we're dissolving cultures and getting back to feeding. McDonald's is a feeding stop. Burger King is a feeding stop. Taco Bell is a feeding stop. They got different flavors and stuff like that, but it's a feeding spot. They're giving you processed food, food that is not connected to you or any other culture. You, I mean, hell, how many... When the last time you went to Taco Bell, I mean, because it's supposed to be Mexican food, but when the last time you went to Taco Bell with a Mexican? Or you seen a Mexican in there? Hell, how many times you seen a Mexican working in uh, uh, Taco Bell? They talking about running for the border and shit. Come on, man. Let's move on. Cultural so, that's the end of her paper. Why food is important? Why food is an important part of culture? Cross-cultural um, rhetoric blog. This is the cross-cultural rhetoric blog, um, blog. This article is from Oboro University in Sweden, March 22nd, 2012. Our main conclusion, they're talking about the paper, why food is an important part of culture. Our main conclusion in the essay was that yes, you can in fact learn about a country's culture by studying the food, culture that is part of it. It can show the population view on such central values as relationship building, men and women roles in both family and society, 
the, and degree of openness towards other cultures. Furthermore, since relationships are often established and maintained in social situations where food hold a central place, missing food culture is missing a vital part of becoming integrated into a new culture. Now, so once again, they're studying how to get into cultures and how to influence people. But listen to the opening piece. Our main conclusion in this essay was that, that yes, you can in fact learn about a country's culture by studying that food, the food of the culture that is part of it. It can show the population's views on such central values as relationship building, men and women roles, in both family and society, and the degree of openness towards other cultures, right? So could it be that the uh, relationships are falling apart in America because we're feeding now? We're not eating. We're not taking the time to to create the meals that 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 foster the relationships, that enforce and reaffirm reaffirm firm the cultures that we want. Could it be? That um, gender roles are, are, are slipping because um, we're not sharing the meals in, 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 in traditional ways. Could it be um, that openness, we're becoming too open because, um, you know, we're feeding, right? Because I want you to understand that, you know, dropping the culture benefits nobody but capitalism, you know? It don't benefit us. You know what I'm saying? We could be open to other cultures. We could learn about other cultures and stuff like that. But if we surrender in ourselves, what good is that? When you give up who you are, let's move on. All right. This is all about cuisines, the importance of food and preserving cultural identity. Throughout most of history, bonds and shared cultures have been created when meals are prepared and shared. We need to bring the importance of community back into food. Our heritage is often passed down and intimately bound up in the food we eat. Food availability, climate, and cooking techniques evolved over many generations and have united individuals and group of people in, in, in distinct cultures. Family. I'm just, uh, um, if we do not take the time to teach the younger generations how to cook and interact with food, they will not be able to engage with their cultural, with their culture and bond with the past. How about ourselves? How many of us are bonding with our culture and our past and our diets? This is a serious issue. If we're talking about really building anything substantial, if we're talking about taking ourselves to the next level, right? Because I know it's, it's, you know, you you got other motivational and other coaches out here that that's, 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 that's letting you do whatever and encouraging you, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not telling you not to explore, but I'm telling you, you have to have a foundation, right? You have to have a foundation. Um, last, last one. This is culture, food, and identity. Sixth, this is the sixth in a series on culture and development by Mervyn Claxton. Food, cooking, and eating habits play a central role in every culture. Eating is never purely biolo is never purely a biological activity unless you're feeding. Since the consumption of food, whether it is simply or elaborately, or elaborately prepared, is always imbued with meaning, which is understood and communicated in various symbolic ways. Preparing food for consumption and eating socially are activities that are conducted for purpose other than mere nutrition, unless you're feeding. The symbolic meaning of food sometimes has little to do with the food itself as in the use of rice to shower newlyweds in certain cultures. And eating socially has less to do with nutrition than with communication and relationship. Food has also played an important part in religion, helping to find the separateness of one creed 
from another is by means of dietary taboos. Now, I'm jumping. Food habits can serve as vehicle of deep emotion. They are normally learned early and well and are mostly inculcated by effectively significant adults since they can acquire enduring sentimental power. One, one does not become an adult in the abstract. It must happen in terms of some particular substantive body of cultural material. Food and eating are positioned near the core of such material materials because of their life giving and essential and essentially, though usually routinely and spiritually perfunctionary nature. As such, they are repetitively cons constitutive of one's culturally specific humanity. Children are trained accordingly. The learning of personal fastidiousness, manual dexterity, cooperation and sharing restraints and reciprocity are commonly linked to the consumption of food by children. Indeed, getting to eat with adult as an with adults as an adult rather than as a child may be one of the major hurdles of growing up in some cultures. Cause some of our kids be acting crazy because we no longer eat together. And they, they no longer have to practice the reciprocity of passing the book, passing the peas, passing the salt. You know what I'm saying? That's not a daily thing no more. You know what I'm saying? Food is part of rites of passage. There are certain foods and certain drinks that children are not allowed to 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 get without the supervision of adults. Right? There's certain things that they are they you know what I'm saying? So the food is actually part of the rites of passage. Most civilizations have been built on the cultivation of one staple food crop. We spoke about this, which is almost invariably endowed with the religious significance, the origin of which is usually shrouded in myth. And mo my question is, what is our staple? Hmm? Black folks, black folks, what's our staple? Everybody else got a staple food. What's our staple food? Grippos, Lay's, Taco Bell, Burger King, McDonald's. In most cultures, also people often do not feel satisfied if their principal meal does not involve a product of traditional staple food. Our food connects us to our culture connects us to our heritage, connects us to our ancestors. The fact that generation after generation of your people have eaten this same thing. Matter of fact, let me show y'all something. We had a show about this. This is the African yam. This is specifically the one that is grown in Ghana. Right? Always in my house. Always in my house. You know what I'm saying? I'm just now learning how to eat them, right? I'm, you know, because I'm gonna steam some later for later on today. I'm gonna try, I'm try something new. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? Boom! My wife gets a taste of home. She has the comfort of knowing that for traditions, I mean for for generations, somebody in her family has eaten this. As a right, as a matter of fact, she knows that at the same time she's possibly eating this. Somebody in her family is eating it as well. Also, her people live by the sea. Y'all see that? Y'all see that? She she's getting it prepared with with her traditional seasons and stuff on there, and she's letting it sit in the refrigerator right now, right? I just want to show y'all this, right? So I have to ask the question: What is our staple? And if we don't have a staple, we need to get one. Now, in my family, the staple was rice. Rice, you know what I'm saying? I ate so much damn rice. I was almost insulted when he told me rice came from China. Right? I'm like, well, goddamn it, we Chinese. Every meal, my grandmother always had rice on that damn table. And matter of fact, we had rice so much that I didn't even notice notice it until my aunt came back from being gone for a while and said, "You ain't never noticed that you eat rice every day? What? 
We eat rice every day. Damn, we do eat rice every day. You know what I'm saying? In my grandma's house, there's always there was always a bowl of rice. You understand what I'm saying? Rice, you know, staples. What are the staples? We need you need to identify a staple in your family. And if you can't identify a staple in your family, you need to establish a staple for your family. A healthy starch. You know what I'm saying? A healthy food that is a staple that you that in some form or fashion your children will be able to eat and connect with you. Because one day you're going to be an ancestor. And you don't want your children connecting with you through a got some goddamn Taco Bell. You know what I'm saying? You want you don't want them connecting with you with, with a Burger King. You know what I'm saying? Because that stops with you. They don't go back. You know what I'm saying? Your grandparents wouldn't eat no goddamn Taco Bell. You want them to be able to connect with a deep historical idea. All right. Damn, this is a long video. I'm sorry, family. I'm sorry. Thus, the diet of 75% of the world's population is still based on one principal starch food. The gradual disappearance of traditional foods and traditional cuisine is a result of increase of internationalization of certain standardized Western foods. Is an erosive is a roast of cultures of non-Western society as well as cultural identity of the people concerned. Babe, listen, li 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 listen, listen, family, listen. War does not just take place on a battlefield. Politics, well, my fault it is a battlefield. Politics is a battlefield. Economics is a battlefield. This is what you, those of you that's watching the news right now, this is what the Paris Accords is about. Battle. Donald Trump is saying, Donald Trump is throwing down the gauntlet in certain, we are going to renegotiate. We're going back to war. You know what I'm saying? Either we're going to renegotiate or we're going back to war. That's what all this shit is about. It's war. Politics, economics, social, psychological. When you are waging war, when you are trying to dominate others, you have to dominate them totally. And Food is a weapon. When you take away a people's uh, traditional food, they have no connection with the past. Hold on. Mint states that African slaves in the Caribbean not only use food and cooking as a form of creative expression, but also the, the, that the very process of creating cuisine of their own was on the building box features one of the building block features in the reconstruction of the culture and cultural identity all right so i'm gonna stop right there family but the point that i'm trying to make is this there's a direct direct link to culture and food now what we're trying to do with the ngusa Sapa challenge because the ngusa Sapa challenge is specifically designed for african americans it doesn't mean that only african americans could take the, um, the 21 day challenge, the 21 day in Guza Saba challenge, right? Anybody could take it, but it's specifically designed for African Americans to help get African Americans aligned back with their cultural heritage, right? How you express that cultural heritage, I don't give a damn, but at least I have to take it upon myself as a culture builder to help reintroduce you to some ideas that will lead you back to your culture and lead you back to sanity. Because right now we are insane. Right? We, we have lost total contact with who we were. Total. Right? We're being dominated. Now it shows that we're being dominated in our dietary choice to the point where now we are eating as beasts of burdens. That's even worse. That's even worse than the captive diet. Or what most of y'all who are not familiar with my vernacular, slave diet. Now we're eating. We're feeding like cattle. Because it's all just about getting energy. It's all just about calories. Family. It's deeper than that. 
This is Brother Hatim saying I want to thank you for joining the journey. For those who are in the time crunch, I'm sorry for taking so long, but you know I got to greet y'all. And I, you know, but those that took the time to make it through the video, I appreciate you. And I say peace. As a matter of fact, thank you for watching the video. I want you to subscribe. Click the bird right there, the fiery bird. And I also have a special video just for you, right there. And for those that want more information about Jamie Journey, go to our site. It should be right about there. Peace.